era, but I assure you, whatever it is, it's not pretty. But there's something about Joseph. He's a man who's industrious. He's a man who was trained well by his father. And so when he was under Potiphar's tutelage and, and supervision as a slave, it says Potiphar didn't even worry about his own household. He just let Joseph run the place because everything he did, he did well. And when he gets into the prison, that same uh, attitude, that same spirit, that same industriousness and, and organizational skill, all of that's on exhibit. And so ultimately the prison leader, whoever he is, we don't know his name, he turns the entire prison over to Joseph and he becomes, I think the term that, that's used in the prison world these days is a trustee. He's a prisoner, but he's one who runs the show. And so he's been elevated. And what's God doing? Even as his brothers are trying to debase him and humiliate him every way they can, they take off his robe, they sell him for 12 bucks each. Even as they're doing that, what's God doing? God's elevating him. First to an entire household. The captain of the Imperial Guard would be a pretty good job in ancient Egypt. And, you know, he would have many others under him. Their whole job is to protect Pharaoh. They're used to being around the trappings of wealth. Nobility, it would have been a big, large, manor-type home, not some little hovel. And now he's running the entire prison. Who knows how many hundreds of prisoners might have been in that prison? But he's got all of that under him. So God is raising him up, even as his brothers have tried to put him down. But it could be hard to see that in your distress as you're living out all of this life as you're having to learn Egyptian, which isn't your primary language, as you're dealing with all of the horrors that are going on in a prison, let's at least stipulate to the fact that there's likely torture going on. And so you hear the cries and the screams. Maybe some of that was done to him, maybe not. We don't know. But remember, he was allegedly in there for attempting to rape his master's wife. So might he have been tortured? It's conceivable anyway. Bible doesn't say it, so we can't say for sure. But I'm trying to paint a scenario for you to help you understand what's going on in Joseph, that many times the path to um, elevation or exaltation it goes right through the valley of the shadow of death. All right, so his brothers come, they need to buy food, and eventually he can't hold back any longer and so, as they're talking among themselves, he does ultimately show his hand and tell them who he is. And so, um, we, have this, we have this story in, in uh, Genesis 45. So, Joseph now said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now again, what voice do you hear when you hear those words? Option one, I am Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Uh-oh. Okay, that's the harsh retribution voice. How about this one? Now come near to me, please. So they come near and he says, I am your brother, Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. That one may not be retribution, but it's, I got you where I want you. But maybe a third voice would be, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And they're having a group hug. Now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Note that he is not letting them off the hook. He's not saying it doesn't matter. He's not pretending it didn't happen. There's no denial here. There is a cold-eyed, steely acknowledgement of the facts. How could it be any other way after 22 years? But he says to them, God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now that is reinterpreting your entire story in the light of God's hand. And really at the core of what we do in inner healing is we help people understand the story that God is weaving out of their life 
in the midst of all the horror and difficulty they've been through. Because again, if God is good and Romans 8.28 is true, right? God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, either that is true or it's not. If it's not, get up and walk out of those doors and renounce your Christianity today. I mean it. I'm serious. If it's true that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, like Joseph, then you can look at that and say, wow, whatever I had to go through, God is going to bring good out of evil. And that is the amazing thing about God himself. And so he's, he says, don't be distressed. And in another place, I won't go there, but in another place it says, when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, all the Egyptians heard it because, in fact, he was bawling and sobbing and crying and all of that pain, all of that rejection, all of that abandonment, all of that humiliation, probably the beatings, all of being accused as a rapist. The Scripture tells us he wouldn't lay a finger on that woman. He's a strapping 17-year-old boy. Do you think he wanted to get laid by a hot woman? Of course he did, but he wouldn't do it. He said, how could I sin against God and also my master, when he has entrusted everything into my hand except you. I couldn't possibly do this. And out of that, she turns in rejection, sin sickness, and accuses him of rape, and all of this befalls him in the prison. This is his entire narrative, and all of that is coming out like a geyser. That's what's going on. And so one of the biggest things that happens when people are going through healing of past hurts when they're going through inner healing, is there is normally a release of emotion. And I've ministered on this topic literally for decades, and right at this moment I have in my mind a particular church, which shall remain unnamed, but at the end of teaching on these matters one time, the pastor who came from, I would say, a very emotionally locked down and somewhat controlling and abusive family environment he said, you're just trying to provoke people to be emotional. I said, no, I'm not. I'm trying to get them to let go of their pain because there'll be a subterranean river of that pain. And until that stuff goes away, the person isn't free. How did Joseph get to this place? Well, he was a dreamer of dreams, and because there were really no other options other than maybe occultic ones among the Egyptian astrologers and so forth, um, it's very likely that the way Joseph got healed was by God himself. In, in those dark nights of the soul, literally, he would have dreams and God would give him more understanding. Maybe he'd wake up in a bed that was wet with tears. But this is how he was going through it. Can there be sovereign inner healing? Sure, of course. But again, we're trying to teach you techniques on how to bring people to this so you can't just say, yeah, go sleep for 10 years and maybe three nights out of the 10 you'll have a dream that'll be transformative for you. We'd like to move it along a little quicker than that. Okay, so Joseph has reinterpreted all of his hurtful experiences in the light of God's purposes. And so in the long run, there's, no, there's nothing left in him to cause difficulty for him. Jesus said at one time, here comes the prince of this world, and he has nothing in me. Well, this is really what a, what a soul set free, set free looks like. And so here he is with the very guys who threw him into the pit, who sold him into slavery, who humiliated him, who valued his life at about 12 bucks each, or 240 all up, right? Um, so here he is with those guys, and he's like, hey, don't blame yourselves. It's okay. God, God was in this, and uh, I'm not going to harm you. And they're like... <laughs> My head is exploding. Who does this? Nobody lives this way. But this is what happens in inner healing. And again, it seems like um, he forgave easily because of these happenings in the light of God's plan. Now, there are three specific passages in the book of Genesis. They're all in chapter 39, verse 2, verse 9, and then a uh, four-verse passage, 20 to 23, in which it says explicitly, God was with him. So in the midst of his darkness, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his imprisonment, remember, 22 years. None of you over here is even 22 years old. So it's like your whole lifetime. Well, maybe you on the end. <laughs> I saw her nudge you. <laughs> but, but, I mean, think about I'm just trying to put this into perspective, right? 
I won't divulge Anna's age, but she's only barely above 22 years old. And so, you know, most of her lifetime. This is the whole story of Joseph, but now this, this is coming out, and it's coming out because the Lord was with him. And so, again, we have to hold on to this idea that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. All right, let me tell you a story, of, a modern story. I was in a town called Wyala, South Australia. You've never heard of it, and you never will hear of it. The locals call it Flyala because there's so many flies that they just cover you up and they bite. But it, it happens to be on a, on a bay, and there was a steelworks built there because there was some nearby uh, iron ore and coal. And so a little town grew up there, and it is literally on the edge of the outback. You cross the street, and you'll be in the outback. And so um, very remote area, and I was ministering in a Baptist church, and there was a woman there whose um, father had died after her mother died. And he had remarried after his, her mother's death, and he left her, uh, not, whether it was deliberate or not, I mean, he died, but she's now in the care of her stepmother, and this is a classic Cinderella story. She was the evil stepmother. And so um, the stepmother forbid her to go to school. She made her clean and scrub and do laundry and mind the house. So her, her mental and emotional development were retarded, held back. Um, her, her stepmother used to beat her if she didn't do her chores exactly according to specification. And um, she began to develop a series of conditions at which her mother threw her out of the house and she was rendered homeless on the edge of the outback. Somebody from the church took her in and um, she lived with them for some years and was in a kind of a uh, very slight recovery process, not a very steep one. And this was her story. And I, I met this woman uh, in the meeting and I began to pray with her. And the first thing she had to do was to forgive her father for dying. Now, you could say, well, but he died. Right. And he didn't plan to die, I assume. Maybe he did. Maybe he knew what he was married to and he wanted out. I'm not sure. But anyway. <laughs> but, you know, family life can be kind of weird sometimes. Uh, but anyway, she had to forgive her father for dying. That might not be your go-to prayer move when you're praying for somebody who's been through a horrific experience like this. But it's very analogous to what we were talking about the other day, right? Forgiving yourself and then going through that, or forgive your father and then you go through that. So she forgives her father for dying. Of course she has to forgive the evil stepmother. That goes without saying. Uh, but it's hard to do, of course. And as we were doing this, she was healed of several skeletal conditions. And the one that I remember was that her right shoulder was severely out of place and out of joint. So it kind of looked like scoliosis, but it wasn't really scoliosis because it was the shoulder blade, not the spine. Um, but it popped and went back into position. And she had multiple skin conditions uh, that included a pigmentation disease that made her partially albino. Part of her body was not albino, part of it was albino. Her pigmentation grew in. Talk about being stripped of your dignity, right? So anyway, it was a very dramatic healing, um, but it's an example of what happens in this process of inner healing. All right, we've got a couple from the New Testament that are good examples of this too. And I'm, I'm taking a little longer. I ran past my uh, stop time. Uh, but I'm doing this because particularly in evangelical churches, uh, people really struggle with the idea of inner healing. They, they, you, you always hear them say, where's that in the Bible? So I'm showing you where it is in the Bible. I just showed it to you with Joseph and how he went through inner healing and ultimately was restored in relationship to his brothers. Then I gave you a story of a woman who had physical healing because of that. There's two stories in the New Testament. One is the road to Emmaus. It's about a 22-verse long passage that deals with the two disciples that Jesus comes upon uh, as they are walking along immediately following the, the crucifixion. 
And it's evident from the conversation that they're disillusioned and hurt by watching Jesus die. And they even say to him, not recognizing that it's he, they even say to him, we thought he was going to be the one that would be the savior of Israel. And then Jesus enters into that dilemma. He's literally, literally walking with them through the disappointment and grief and trauma because they're walking on the Emmaus Road. We, we use that language, we'll walk with you. It comes out of the Bible, by the way, right from here. It's now just become a turn of phrase, but this is where it's located. So he's walking along with them, entering that dilemma, the pain, the grief, and through conversation, he puts their memories of failure and frustration into a new and positive light. How does he do it? By using the Word of God. Because the Bible says, he speaks to them and says, O foolish and, and uh, slow to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, and then opening the scriptures, he explained to them all the scriptures concerning himself. So he reinterpreted the experiences in the light of the word of God. So I don't have anything per se against a lot of what goes on in modern psychology, but I will say your most powerful tool for this kind of healing is going to be the lens of the word of God. It will allow you to see things in the right light, just as we saw happened with Joseph through that 22-year period of healing that the father took him through prior to his being reunited with his brothers. And Jesus said their lack of understanding of the purposes of God and their faithless attitude toward the scriptures contributed to their despondency. So one of the things that I always tell people is we need more scripture in our churches, not less. I'm not a fan of these sermons that have three verses or two verses, and then we just sort of go off. We need people grounded in the Word of God. And one of the reasons the modern church is drifting off course, not just with their own health and healing, but with their doctrine and the way we interact with society, is people are not grounded in what the Bible says. It is our lens of reality, period. So... He brings them back to the Scripture, and then using those Scriptures, he reinterprets their negative experience into one that is actually meaningful. He shows them a new source of power and hope. And I would assume, somewhere in there, it doesn't say it, he got them to forgive Jesus' executioners and his enemies. And, you know, I, I could almost imagine it could be very humorous, you know, because Jesus at times is very playful. It could be very humorous. You could be saying, so guys, why are you angry with my executioners anyway? They lost. Right? Or, or why are you angry with the Sanhedrin for turning me over for execution? Uh, you know, I, I, I frightened half of them to death when I appeared to them. And there, there are some apocryphal stories from that era that suggest, they're, they're, not, they're not Bible but they suggest that to a number of prominent members of the Sanhedrin, Jesus kind of just, hi guys, here I am. <laughs> so I could just imagine what he might have been saying to Clopas and whoever this sidekick is. But he reinterprets the whole thing. And he says, didn't you even understand from the scriptures that the Christ had to suffer? It was necessary that this was in the intention of God. And so now that they have a reframing of reality, they have an expanded perspective of his death and his resurrection, his victory, and they understand now that they can go on. But they don't actually realize that it's him doing it until they sit down to eat, and then he breaks bread. And there must have been something about the way Jesus broke bread is the way I figure it. You know, Some people might just tear it like this. Some people might grab it and do it like this. But however you break bread, there must have been something that was unique to the way Jesus did it. And that's why in the moment they go, ah! But then he vanishes from their sight too. But it says they go on their way rejoicing. They were despondent, but now they're rejoicing. So inner healing will change that moroseness of the heart. Now, I remember early on in the Australian revival, um, going to a church near Melbourne, Australia. It wasn't in Melbourne, but, but near there. Uh, and there was a woman there, we were meeting with an eldership team. I had another guy that was traveling with me a lot in those days. And we had a team of, I guess it must have been 15 or 20 elders. And they set up these chairs and, you know, we were going to pray for them and prophesy and answer some questions. And, uh, and there was a woman on that elder team and she had severe depression. And her issue was that she had had a fourth child who died of crib death. She still had three children, and she still had a husband who loved her, but she had been in a severe depression for more than a year, and she wanted to die. She literally said, I want to die. And when the Holy Spirit fell on her, she had to say farewell to her baby, 
which she had never really done. She'd been unwilling to let the baby go. So she let go by saying goodbye. And then um, the Lord, I don't remember if it was me or my, my friend, but anyway, one of us said, now you still have three children and your husband, right? Yes. Do you think they need you? Note that it wasn't a statement. It wasn't a condemnation. It was just a question. Do you think they need you? Well, yes, they do. So while you're busy mourning the one, four are going untended. And that did something. And she just, it was a word of wisdom. It, it did something. It snapped her out of that rut that she was in. The power of God came on her. She did get delivered of three spirits of death. Uh, one, the desire to be dead. Two, from the death of her child. And the third one was a generational thing. So with all of that gone, she basically came out of the blocks and was able to function again and was taken off all of her medications the following week by her psychiatric care team. Um, about a year later, she had another child. You can never replace a lost child, but at least she had a fourth one to hold in her arms. And so that was a, that was a dramatic healing for her. All right, so the road to Emmaus is, the new, is a New Testament story of inner healing. The other one that we have is Peter and his denial of Jesus. Now, this story is not thought about sometimes by people, but you may remember that Peter had denied Jesus uh, in the courtyard three times, and Jesus had prophesied that it would happen. And um, in the Gospel of John, we have the account of his restoration. And in that account, it's found in chapter 21. I'm not going to read it just because time is over time. But in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, he's gone back to fishing. Now, this is a very intentional turning away from all that he'd been called to because it's about roughly 200 miles from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee. And there was no cars or superhighways in those days, so to go 200 miles, I mean, that's, that's several days traveling, depending on whether you're foot or horseback. Um, why had Peter denied Jesus? Well, Jesus had warned him, Matthew 16, 22, you have your heart set not on God's interest but on man's. And so he didn't really understand why Jesus had to die. Um, then in Gethsemane, he fights to the end when Jesus is being led away. In fact, he even cuts off Malchus's ear, wielding a sword, so he's not willing to let go of the, we'll call it the messianic dream, that Jesus is going to sweep in, kick out the Romans, the, the empire, the kingdom of God empire is going to start, and uh, by the way, I'm going to be Lord Chancellor at his right hand, because I am first of the apostles. So, um, you know, he's got to let go of that carnal dream. And when Jesus is led away, it says Peter followed afar off. That's in Luke twenty two fifty four. So he's following at a distance, which shows his disillusionment and despair. Why do I say that? Well, because he had said, I'm, I'm willing to die with you if necessary. But actually he wasn't, because he knows Jesus is being led away to death, and he's not right there by his side saying, if you're going to take him, take me too. And so he's disengaged, and he's, but he's following at a distance. Um, his faith falters. He denies Jesus three times. This leads to self-condemnation and a strong emotional reaction. He leaves that courtyard, and he is weeping bitterly and in a deep depression. And so it's clear that because of the trauma of Jesus' crucifixion, Satan is trying to gain access to Peter. In fact, uh, Jesus had said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you have turned, so he, Jesus is telling him, you're going to fall away. And he, he told him, you'll all fall away. But specifically you, Peter, you are going to fall away. But when you have turned, you will come back. So when it's happened, then strengthen your brothers. But the way the Gospel of John reads, you wouldn't have any reason to believe that Jesus had appeared to Peter. If you look at the synoptic gospels, you could come to a different answer. But in John alone, standalone, there's no mention of Jesus having appeared to Peter, but he's appeared to a lot of other people. And so Peter, I think he just bails completely. He's like, I really did commit the unpardonable sin. I'm, I'm effectively as bad as Judas. And so I'm going back to fishing. And when he goes back to fishing, he has seven others to go with him. Most of them are apostles, but Nathaniel's with them too. And so they're in the boat, and um, they're fishing all night long, and they catch nothing. And, uh, you know, we have the saying in modern 
uh, vernacular English, being on a fishing expedition. And what it really means is you're chasing something that's just a lost cause, or you're wasting your time. That's what Peter's doing. He's on a fishing expedition, even though he is a fisherman. And the fact that he's not catching anything is indicative of the fact that this is a lost cause. And I think the other disciples go with him, not because they're bailing out, but because they're thinking about what Judas did, and they're thinking, Peter, out on that lake, nets and fishing weights might not be the best thing that ever happened. So let's go along and make sure. So it's kind of a suicide watch that's going on. And so here they are on the lake, and it's been all night, and dawn is coming, and if you've ever been out before dawn, you know the first things are a bit indistinct. You can't really see much than a few outlines. So they see this thing on the side there of the, of the water. They're only 100 yards away, and, and they're looking at it. Is that a tree trunk, a stump? We don't remember a tree stump there. What is that? And then this voice comes echoing across the water. Children, do you have any fish? And Peter is in such a state he doesn't recognize who it is. But John, the beloved apostle, Peter, it's him right there. So Peter jumps into the water. He swims back to Jesus. And um, Jesus has a fire lit, and there's some fish there. It doesn't say where the fish came from. They, they sure didn't come from the boat, right? <laughs> but, but anyway, so there's a fire lit. Peter denies Jesus three times in the courtyard during the trial, and three times Jesus reinstates him. Do you love me? So it's clear this is an inner healing type of technique. For every denial, for every failure, there's a, there's a healing, there's a, there's a restitution. Now, when we're doing inner healing... You don't necessarily have to go through every single memory, but you do need to go through what Carl Jung called the archetypal memories, the ones that are the anchor memories that hold the pain of all the others. In Peter's case, I think Jesus knew what he was doing. He did need to go through all three of them. When you take people through inner healing, they may have 45 things that they remember possibly three or four are the only ones that really matter. They're the ones that are radioactive. They're the ones that hold that emotional intensity and pain. Those are the memories that you will clean out. And the way you'll know to do them is the person will generally tell you. You might get a word of knowledge or a prophetic word too. But in the natural, if there's no supernatural overlay going on, you'll know because they'll say, I always think about this thing that happened to me when I was five years old. Or, my brother always used to say this to me up until I beat him up and left home at age 18. Okay, that thing. It'll be that kind of a, they know because it's the thing that's always in their mind, always in their head. And in Peter's case, what was always in his head ever since the crucifixion? I don't know who he is. No, no, I'm not a Galilean. And then he calls down curses on himself. So... That's what's been on his mind. And so Jesus takes him back to that, and he says, you said you didn't know me. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. You said you weren't a Galilean, but you are. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. So Jesus is addressing those three key memories that Peter needed to have um, healed. All right, so... He is then given a new commission, feed my sheep. Now this heals Peter emotionally, and with it, it renews him spiritually and relationally. And I think this is really at the, at the center of the ancient Roman Catholic teaching that Peter is the prince of the apostles, because Jesus had said, when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. And so whether you agree with it or not, I think this is really where that is coming out of is this idea that he's been restored in this manner, and therefore he is the lead apostle, according to Roman Catholic doctrine. All right, so let's summarize this. Healing of past hurts is valid for the Christian ministry today. I've given you three examples from Scripture where it went on. Uh, Joseph and his experiences, the road to Emmaus, and Peter's restoration. Um, we believe that Jesus brought emotional healing to many. He said in his inaugural sermon in Luke 4.18 that he was sent to bind up, bind up, bind up the brokenhearted. He was sent to set prisoners free, and he was sent to release the oppressed. So the binding up of the brokenhearted is very much in the center 
of what the inner healing ministry is about. And you can see in all of these stories that we've looked at, in the case of Joseph, there were very specific people who were the cause of the pain where he was sinned against. In the case of the two on the road to Emmaus, there were specific individuals, but it wasn't directed at them, but nevertheless they were damaged by what they had experienced and observed. And with Peter, it's somehow a blend of, of that. Uh, because he does have this slave girl who puts him on the spot, um, but they didn't really come after him at the time of the arrest and the crucifixion. So it's somewhere in between. All right, Jesus comes with the intent of freeing us from the evil which burdens us. Hebrews 13, 8 says, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he did in the New Testament, he will do now, and he will continue doing it, until time ends and there is a new heavens and a new earth. He takes our memories of the past and the pain associated with them and um, he heals them so that they no longer affect us. Now the way I like to illustrate this so that it's very clear what I, what I mean by it, you can't really see it very well, but on this finger, my left index finger, I have a scar that is about a finger width wide right there on the edge and that scar came to me when I was 19 years old, except it wasn't a scar initially. So I was at a party with some friends, and there were some foolish things going on, as happens with teenagers. And um, without being too specific and lewd, there was a cucumber being passed around, and people were doing certain things with that cucumber. And I grabbed it and went to the sink, and I picked up a knife, and I began slicing it, so it could not be used as a prop any longer. And I was, I probably had a couple beers in me, and I, uh, as I was slicing, I wasn't paying attention, and I sheared off the edge of my finger. It was very painful, and I nearly died of that right there, because I severed an artery, and it was spurting. And so, you know, we had to get the bleeding under control. They took me to the local medical center. Of course, my mother knew nothing, and uh, <laughs> they cauterized it. And uh, anyway, it took, it took several months for it to heal properly. And it was very sensitive and tender initially. But I live to tell the tale. I'm here telling you about it. But here's the thing. It's totally healed today. You can still see the scar. I know that something happened. That reminds me of that night of foolishness when I was at that party I probably shouldn't have even been at. But I can do this and roll my finger. I, I can grab ropes. I can you know, do whatever. There's no pain. There's nothing left there that bothers me at all, and yet there is a scar that I can see. That's what will happen to somebody who's been well inner healed. They'll be able to acknowledge what happened to them, but there will be no further reactivity, triggering, uh, pain, depression, anxiety, blah, 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 all of that will all be gone. That's how you know when people are healed. Because A lot of times people say, how do I know when it's done? When you've got that effect going on internally. Now, I'll tell you a story. John, you, you would relate to this a little bit because it happened in Germany. When we were in Germany in March, um, I ended up praying with one of our team members for a woman whom I know in Germany. In the past, she's come to a lot of my meetings there, and we've developed a friendship. It's nothing more than that, but, but you know, I, I think about her and I care about her. She was healed of cancer uh, that she had developed out of having um, human papilloma virus. Uh, when I prayed for her about five years ago. And so we kind of have a, a story together of her getting breakthrough. So one of the teammates went with me into this room, and the three of us were together praying. And um, she, she had had a bad falling out with her church where I had met her. I won't go into the details, but, but it was a very bad falling out. Some of it's a little even hard to understand, but it was rooted in a lot of pain and drama. And... Uh, Anyway, I was supposed to have prayed for her in a different place, different city from where I did ultimately pray for her. But when she walked into the church building where we were originally going to meet, close by her home, the church where she had the falling out, she reacted and triggered so badly that she couldn't stay in the building. And she ran out of the building into the rainy night. And she didn't even have money to get home. And she walked down these rainy streets, and somehow she found an open ATM, got a little bit of money, got an Uber, and went home because her home was about 20 minutes away by car. But that's what it looks like when people are not inner healed. 
So when I sat down to pray with her, I said, you know what you think is your problem, because she had this huge complex of allergies. I said, what you think is your problem isn't your problem. Your problem is that you have unresolved anger and you triggered when you walked into the church. The fact that you triggered walking into that church is prima facie evidence that you are not healed around that falling out that happened with the pastor and the other people with whom you used to work. She did not want to hear this. And I didn't say it that firmly. I was trying to be very gentle, but, but I did tell her that, and she did not want to hear that. She said, I don't have any unforgiveness toward them. And I'm like, <laughs> what planet are you from? So anyway, she didn't get healed. Um, and the, the other prayer team member who was with me for that prayer engagement she kind of checked out about halfway through it. She didn't leave the room, but I could tell from her body language, and you know, she's kind of looking at her phone and pulls out her Bible, but she wasn't really reading it. She's just trying to wrap it up because we were stuck. We were stalled out on this issue that she couldn't get beyond. So it's not that hard to run a diagnostic. When you see people who trigger, who react, who have this sort of thing on a routine basis, all of us have our moments. So we're not trying to you know, put people in a box. But if it's a routine pattern, that's how you know that things are still not resolved. All right, past hurts bring sickness to the emotions, but to every aspect of the human personality. And as I mentioned, she had a bunch of allergies that had popped up out of nowhere, and I know it's related to this unresolved matter with her former leadership and uh, teammates at that church. <coughs> God takes a long view of things. I'm sure she's going to get healed eventually. But it may be a bit of a journey and not necessarily an easy one. All right, so healing of past hurts opens us up to renewal, not only of our emotions, but to every other facet of life affected by those past hurts. So how do we go through uh, praying for people for this kind of healing? Well, uh, step one. We need to receive forgiveness to the extent we need it. Now, this is not healing of sin sickness, so it may or may not be a category. But a lot of times we need to forgive the others who have harmed us or wounded us. And I use those two terms deliberately. Harming means intent to harm. Wounded may be they didn't realize what they were doing, but it was nevertheless hurtful and painful. And so with that, we can forgive people for acting in ignorance. Jesus did this on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So we forgive the, the, whoever this other party is that was part of this problem. As we forgive, this should begin unlocking or breaking the pattern of reflexive, reactive responses and behavior that are coming out of life's traumas. The second thing we do is we allow Jesus to reinterpret and heal the bad memories in prayer and also in conversation. I call these prophetic conversations or healing conversations. Um, really, Joseph had gone through it already with the Lord, so he in turn does it with his own brothers who need to let themselves off the hook for what they've done. Now, let's just think about this one for a second. We've got 10 brothers who have been guilty of this in, uh, what they thought they were going to do, murder him. They back away from that, but they sell him into slavery. But for 22 years, they've been having a conversation among themselves. How do you know it's been a conversation among themselves for 22 years? Because when they're standing in Joseph's presence, I read the passage, they say to themselves, among themselves, in Hebrew, not knowing that he knows Hebrew, because he's speaking Egyptian, they say among themselves, oh, this is all happening because we didn't listen to our brother's pleas for mercy when he was calling out from the pit and then as he was being taken away by the Ishmaelites, hey guys, they don't do this to me! They've been talking about this for years. And just imagine what their lives are like, every one of them, all ten of them, with their own wives, with their own children, as they, as they think about this every night, as they maybe tuck their children in bed, and they're thinking, my God, this is what I put my own father through. If I were to lose this child, how would I, how would I even cope? How would I live to see tomorrow? And that's what dad is going through, and that's why he's always morose and downbeat, and that's why he said, I'll go down to the grave in sorrow, and I'll go to Sheol itself, which is the Hebrew word for hell. So that's what they're dealing with. And I assure you, this is not a happy family. 
This is a family that has been destroyed by the hidden sin, and they're all carrying a piece of it. So when Jesus reinterprets these bad memories, people get unlocked from all of that. In the case of the brothers, he reinterprets for them, God allowed this in order that you would be spared, and so that's the reinterpretation. On the Emmaus Road, Jesus reinterprets everything in the light of Scripture so that they would know this had to happen because it was prophesied. And with Peter, he takes him through the threefold denial and a threefold restoration. This is how we, we reframe the story. Now, let me be very clear about this. Do not use crap prophecy to do this process. There's a lot of this stuff. About, well, you know, the Lord's in charge. And I remember when our daughter Carissa was born, and she's a, she's a handicapped child who's on the verge of being healed. It's been a long journey. But people used to come to my wife and they would say, God knew you could carry this, and that's why he let you have this child. More than one. And my wife is a strong woman, and she's a, a patient and kind woman. Uh, but you know, she would say to me privately, I don't know if I'm strong enough to carry this. My number one fear in life was that I would have a handicapped child, and here I am with a handicapped child. Not only that... You know, they would say things like, well, God's going to use it so you can minister more powerfully to others who have handicapped children. Do not use that kind of crap prophecy. That is all BS, and it is all prophesying from the flesh. All of it. What you want is a valid word from God that says, this is what's happening in you for you. That's what you want. And there's way too much of that other stuff that goes on in inner healing circles. I hear it all the time, and it's the one thing that makes me dislike inner healing. I mean, I do it, and I believe in it. But if there's anything about it I don't like, it's that dynamic that I see go on over and over again. So, Jesus is reinterpreting things in the light of Scripture and bringing people to closure, and that makes a huge difference. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. I was in Melbourne, Australia. This would be maybe now eight or seven years ago. And they brought a woman to me who had been psychotic for 25 years. She'd been incarcerated in a mental hospital on three occasions, one of them longer than 10 years. And other times she was treated outpatient. She's married, uh, but she was, she was a case. And they bring her to me asking me to pray for her, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do with this one? And so I sit down next to her. She's on my left, and the pastor's just beyond her, further to my left. And I'm, I'm looking at her, and the Lord speaks to me, and he says, ask her about her mother's abortion. Now, that's random, and it's certainly not the kind of thing you would usually ask anyone about. And I, and I looked up, and in my mind, I'm talking to the Lord, and I said, I can't do that. Um, Americans have a reputation for being brash. I'm too loud anyway. Th this is not the right question. Give me something else. And again, the word of the Lord came to me a little more firmly. The tone was, was more disciplinarian. I said, ask her about her mother's abortion. That's verbatim what the word of the Lord was. Please, Lord, anything but that. I mean, just, just give me something else. There's got to be some other way to get breakthrough with this. I said, ask her about her mother's abortion. Ma'am, I just have to ask you this. I'm feeling led. I wasn't feeling led. I was feeling shoved. <laughs> I'm feeling led to ask you this. Um, I know this is a weird question, and it's probably completely inappropriate, but I, it just keeps, I, I have to ask you, did your mother by chance have an abortion? <laughs> How did you know that? That is our most closely guarded family secret. There are only four people in the world who know about this. My mother, me, my sister, and my daughter. And then she looks at me and she goes, and we're all crazy. And I'm like, there it is, the cover-up. That's what these boys have been living in, in, in the story of Joseph, the cover-up. There was a book that came out some years ago called We Were the Mulvaney's. It was on Oprah's bestsellers list, and it was about 
a woman who was raped in the South, and how they covered it up and it destroyed their entire family. These things, Jesus said, what you do in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. And so these things must be addressed, even if it's hard. It's, it's hard because there's sin there, because there's pain there, because there's damage that's been done. But it's like when a doctor's setting a bone. It may hurt like crazy when they readjust that thing, but the intent is to heal. And so you may hate the resetting, but you love it when you are healed again and can function. That's what the Lord is about. God is always good. All things work together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. This is that verse writ large and, and lived out. So this woman, is, when she says that, I said, well, that's it then. And she said, what's it? And I said, the blood of your sister is crying out from the ground, seeking recompense. And then using John 20, 23, I reached over and I touched her right here, and I said, with this hand, with this hand, I touched her, and I said, I forgive you for being complicit in the murder and cover-up of your sister. Now, she actually wasn't a party to it. It was the eldest child, the first baby that the mother had had, who was aborted. She was child two, but she had been brought into knowledge of this, and her sister was child three. And so this was like the, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I accuse my wife and daughters of having a girls, uh, girls club. So this was the girls club secret in that family. And as soon as I did that, she pitches forward off the chair, hits the floor, it was carpeted, and she starts to foam at the mouth, and this giant pile of foam, about as big as this table, and about this high, is coming out of her mouth, and she lets out this wailing scream, Aah! like that, except I just, at that volume and that intensity, I just ran out of breath after whatever that was, two or three seconds. She went for more than 90 seconds like that. You could hear this, as it's, and I'm looking up at the ceiling, I'm thinking, man, that thing's got to be stuck up there in the rafters. But and eventually, over the cliff. And it was gone. Now, that was an evil spirit. And we're talking about inner healing, but this is directly linked to the inner healing. She was given a discharge order by three doctors with 90 years cumulative experience a few days later and sent home. And she's never returned to mental health care again. So the power of these techniques cannot really be overstated, but they do need to be used well. And part of what had to happen for that woman, I didn't do any what I called crap prophesying. I, but I did have to confront the fact that there had been a cover-up. In a courtroom today, we might call it accessory to murder. And the reason this was a thing at all, aside from the fact that babies in the womb are still babies and therefore it is actually murder, is that in the era in which this occurred, it was murder under Australian law because they had sentiments as we used to have in the U.S. prior to Roe v. Wade that you didn't really do these things. And so we had to address that hidden side of what was going on, and then we could reinterpret it. And it was interesting how the Lord brought vindication to that family. It's too long to go into, but anyway, God is always at work, and Romans 8.28 remains true. All right, the third step. So let's go back. Step one, receive forgiveness if necessary. Uh, step two, allow Jesus to reinterpret and heal the bad memories. Uh, step three, break any soul ties or emotional codependence. Now, soul ties, we usually think of them as coming about through sexual experiences, but they can actually happen when there's just an emotional dependency. So if you think of what's commonly called an emotional affair, that might, that might create a soul tie. But oftentimes, even in families, there's just an unhealthy, it may not be anything um, in terms of like a romance, sometimes a mother-daughter relationship, or worse, a mother-son relationship, and you get something like an Oedipus complex, and I've run into those. We had one guy in Indiana a few months back. He came to the meeting, and he was tatted from head to toe. He had these really long, nasty uh, dreadlocks. He was a white guy, but he was dressing like this, 
and he was he was a mess emotionally, physically, and as we started talking to him, guess what? His mother had come on to him, and they had had what is known as an Oedipal relationship, where he was sleeping with his mother. It's more common when you hear about incest, it's father to daughter, but anyway, that's what had happened. This guy, it was one of the most powerful deliverances I've ever observed. He got delivered, um, but, his, but in the aftermath of that, he now has completely changed his style of dress. He can't really do anything about his tattoos, all of which, by the way, he got deliverance from. Uh, but his hair, he can't change his hairstyle. He now dresses like a normal human being. And um, he has become one of the most powerful ministers of inner healing and deliverance in northern Indiana. And he's become a very close friend of mine. And we do a lot of events together. And he sets up meetings and has me come in and so on and so on. So soul ties can be on multiple levels. And the main thing you're looking for is that unhealthy codependency between two people where there shouldn't be an unhealthy codependency. Could even be between a father, uh, excuse me, a husband and a wife if it's unhealthy. All right, so we're going to break that emotional dependence and the way you do that is I break the power of this soul tie. Jesus gave us the power of binding and loosing. He said what you bind on the earth will be bound in the heaven, what you loose on the earth will be loosed in the heavens. So, I loose this soul tie between you and your, I don't know, husband and the sickness of that relationship and I break the power of all that emotional negative energy that's coming between you as you trigger each other, and I command all of that to leave. That may not be a de demon. That may just be that soul tie, and you're breaking it and releasing it. All right, then the next thing, if there is anything in the bloodline, and again, it's kind of its own conversation, break the power of the bloodline that has come down. Now, the way you'll commonly see this, a lot of times when we think bloodline, we immediately think demonic. But there are, there are certain patterns that occur in families, generation to generation. It might be po poverty, for example. And that can all be rooted in an unhealthy uh, generational soul tie. And so with that, we learn from our parents not just good, but evil. And so we have to release all of that so that that is no longer a driving, controlling factor. Next, step five, renew the mind on a regular basis about your new identity in Christ. Now, what's the best way to do that? Read the Word of God. Read about where Paul says, you know, he raised us up in Christ. He seated us in heavenly places. I know there's a lot of churches that are teaching on identity, and a lot of it's good teaching, but your best single thing to be doing is read the Word of God. And, you know, read passages that say things like, you know, we were once lost, but now we are found. Well, okay, if I'm found, then I am found, and I need to actually grab a hold of that and live in that reality. There's a lot more I could say about that, but anyway. All right, and continue being in the body of Christ where you can grow and experience yet more inner healing. So in Ephesians chapter 4, um, I love this particular one, Ephesians 4, because Ephesus was the place where the most power was on exhibit in Paul's ministry, in his entire ministry. He had the greatest outpouring, amazing, it says extraordinary miracles were done through Paul while he was in Ephesus. And there's no mention of extraordinary miracles. There are miracles, but not extraordinary ones in the other cities that he visited. But in Ephesus, there was extraordinary miracles. And in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, uh, starting in verse 15, that we don't want to be, well, 14 for context, we don't want to be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So we don't want to be unstable people where one day we're doing great with the Lord and the next day we're not doing great with the Lord. I'm, I'm feeling attacked, but God loves me today, so I'm in victory, but now I'm back in the hole and I'm going to go out and get drunk because I'm feeling bad about myself and all that I did wrong. Paul says we don't want to be tossed to and fro like that by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, instead, speak the truth in love. And in this, we are to grow up in every way, in every dimension, in our spirit man, in our minds, in our memories, in our emotions, in our physical bodies. We are to grow up into him who is the head of the body, Christ. And he's used that language in Ephesians 1, so he's basically referring back to what he's already said about Christ is the head of the church and from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint uh, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
What happens in a proper, healthy, functioning church? We become more and more grounded in the reality of Jesus, that we are elementally and essentially connected to him, and that his divine life flows through us, and we become a healing community one unto another, and there are deeper and deeper levels of revelation of who we are, what's our identity, what does it mean to be living the kingdom lifestyle, how do we get free of these old things that may still be hanging around, those last bits of sanctification that haven't yet kicked in, so that we can ultimately become fully mature Christians. We could say men and women. But that is the objective. That is the goal. And so we must be in the church. You cannot find full and complete inner healing without being a member of a church. Now because of the way this thing functions, inner healing, um, it is very important to be sensitive to the person and to the Holy Spirit and to his revelatory gifts. He will often give you insight into things. I've given you multiple examples, so I'm not going to give any more. But he'll give you insight into things that you need to know. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead you into all the truth. Take that at face value. He really did mean it exactly as he said it. You say, well, God doesn't use me that way. Well, he will. Some of you don't even know it's a thing. (laughs) So now that you know it's a thing, you can start asking about it, and he'll start leading you into it. Um, So we have to be open to these various giftings that are necessary to carry this out. And we also want to beware of this superficiality that I was pointing to. And at the same time, avoid needless and hurtful probing. So there are times I have to ask people very pointed questions, and I know they can be quite sensitive and difficult. And when I do, I always say, I know this is a sensitive topic. I'm sorry I even have to ask this, but I just want to be thorough and make sure we don't leave any stone unturned. And then I'll ask the question. And if if the answer is no, none of that applies to me, great. And I never bring it up again. Because I'm not there to probe and poke around. And I'm also not there to gain any lurid information. I think sometimes people do that kind of for their own, I don't know. Sometimes you almost think they're they're trying to hit on the person they're praying for. But anyway, I I will drop it. But on the other hand, if there's something there, I'll say, all right, now we're going to have to address this, but when we're done, we won't have to do it again. And so, here we go, (laughs) and off we, (laughs) and you know, I've never had anybody be angry with me for doing that. They thank me for it in the end because they, they do actually find full and complete closure, like this right here. All right, um, psychology and other secular practices are not, they're not per se wrong, but I will say this, you want to be a little bit cautious because the trends in modern psychology are moving more and more to the new age. And so you, if you're unsure, do some research. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can just find on Wikipedia, even though it's not peer-reviewed, it's a good first place to start. So you can just punch it into your Google browser and up it'll come, or your Google app on your phone, and you'll start to get a sense of whether something has um, roots that are really not what you want to be doing. Reiki therapy, for example, right? Sometimes people are using things like that. All right, and then um, last thing, keep a healthy biblical balance. Um, ultimately, our focus is on our new, new nature in Christ. We are a new creation. And so the, the, the picture of who we are intended to be, who God has called us to be, what has been imparted to us as believers is a truer, more real, and trustworthy evaluation than you know, living in our weaknesses, fears, angers, memories, the four H's. It's, it's just a much, it's a much more real and healthy way to live. And again, I think one of the reasons our society is in the condition it's in is for sure the non-believers don't know anything about this. There was a time when I was a boy, everybody kind of knew the Bible on some level, at least some of it, because it was used in public speeches, public officials quoted it. We were even teach, talking about it in school. Right? So everybody had some basic knowledge of the Bible, and that framed our reality as a nation. Well, they got rid of the Bible in school, and we started drifting away, and churches decided it was cooler to have smoke machines and large services. Um, sorry, I just, I'm not a fan of the whole megachurch model. Um, so they started doing that, and they stopped teaching these deep truths of the Word of God. They're right there on the page. But they stopped really teaching that, and everything became four steps to success in your business career or whatever. That's not really what Christianity is about. 
And then what happened is the people who were still going to the church didn't really know the Bible very well anymore, and so they started embracing a lot of things that are, they're frankly off the list. They, they shouldn't even be going on. And, uh, and now the net effect is guys like John, <laughs> the Yules, me, my wife, my daughter, um, whoever else I have here on the team. Where's Jennifer? I don't see you, but I think you're around somewhere. Uh, back there, okay. Um, anyway, so people that do this kind of ministry with me, a lot of times we have to tell people, you know, what you're actually into is not a good thing to be doing. It's harming you. It may seem like it's beneficial, and I know everybody around you is doing it, but you actually don't want to be doing this. And here's why. I always give them a good biblical reason. I'm going to throw a grenade in the middle of the room right here just because we're here. So, ping, to, and throw. <laughs> Most of you who are going to chiropractors need to stop. Chiropractic is rooted in the occult, and the founder of chiropractic, a man named Donald David Palmer, learned what he learned of chiropractic medicine. Uh, I think it was in 1895, so 128 years ago. Um, in a seance, a ghost appeared to him and gave him what he called the, the science of chiropractic. And from that, it has grown into a phenomenon where nearly every American has a chiropractor. And it is often the case that people who are getting chiropractic care are in the end worse off than they were in the beginning. Or they get on a, like a treadmill where they just keep pouring more and more money into it with no real progress being made. Now, I'm using that one. It's more in the realm of the physical than the uh, mental. But there are plenty of mental therapy techniques that are in play as well. And so we must become more discerning about what we will and will not allow. And I, I'm back to what I keep saying again and again. The Bible is your best lens. The Bible is your best way to frame reality. Now, you may not be a Bible scholar, and so maybe you feel inadequate to do that. But there are people who actually teach the Bible responsibly and who use it in this way. And they will, they will gently guide you away from the stuff that is uh, not helpful to you. And you will, you will do better in the long run by following the Lord than by mixing some occult-based or other religion-based thing that's been imported into the West uh, in our time for purposes of the great end-time deception. All right, with that I will stop. And... Um, we can take a couple questions and then we'll do some praying. Hi, all the way over there. Yeah. Um, I haven't touched on it because it's a big topic. It could be its own conference. And um, this is intended to get people acquainted with this idea of integrated approaches to healing. That is an advanced topic. And um, I've done a fair amount of work with people in that area. But I will say this, you know, in Silicon Valley, they have a saying, the NBT, the new big thing, or the next big thing. So everybody's always chasing the NBT. In the, in the field of Christian healing ministry, dissociation is the NBT right now. And there are a lot of people who are chasing it because they want to be on the cutting edge. They want to be cool. It's, when I was a younger man, my wife and I used to do a lot of skiing. And once I got hooked on skiing, I had no interest in skiing green or blue runs. In fact, I didn't even want to ski black diamond runs. I only wanted to ski double black diamond runs. And that's what people are doing with dissociation. They want to immediately be on the double black diamond slope. And I, I meet a lot of people who, I don't know, they may have had some training somewhere, maybe they haven't, but they want to go around basically saying, oh, you're dissociated, oh, you're dissociated, you're dissociated. And so... We're having a lot of people being told they're dissociating, and maybe they are and maybe they aren't, but they're not actually getting the closure. 
And our goal here is, is restoration and closure. And so rather than open up that giant can of worms, you know, maybe I'll come back next year or we'll do it, I don't know. But the other thing, even my own team, my own TAs in my school and everything, they have at times said, you know, we probably need to start teaching on dissociation. And my standing response to them has always been, when I think I have a large enough group of people who are reliably and responsibly engaging in inner healing and deliverance, and they know how to address sin sickness, and they're seeing transformation happen, then I'll know that I have a group of people who have the basic skill set down well enough that we can start teaching on dissociation and the reintegration of parts. So it takes time to raise disciples who can do that kind of thing, and a lot of people don't even want to be in that, that you know, sector, that field of, of, uh, of healing. And it's because it can be very messy, it can be very ugly. A lot of the stories you hear are the most shocking and horrifying things you could ever imagine. And um, there are a lot of people that when they get into it, they think that's where they want to be. They're questing after the NBT. And once they're in it, they, they are themselves being traumatized by what they're hearing. They're not, them, they're not ready to take that on. Maybe it's not even their calling. But you see, they got there because everybody else was talking about it, and it seemed like the cool and right thing to do. And so it's for all those reasons that I'm hesitant to talk about it. When I run into it, I deal with it. Um, and we've had a lot of success dealing with it, but I don't want to put people on a double black diamond run when right now we're just trying to go down the greens and the blues. That's why I didn't talk about it. And I won't, 